really excited to be here today. It's been, it's been a while since my wife and I have been back, so this is a, a, a blessing to us, and more importantly than excited, I'm, I'm uh, truly humbled and honored to be here this morning, and I just want to thank Pastor Brandon, Pastor Brad, all the elders, all of you guys for welcoming me back with open arms to share the word with you this morning. It, it, it really means a lot to us. This, this church, this ministry gave a 27-year-old at the time kid an opportunity to really dive in and follow his calling and what God was leading him to do and open the doors for me to be able to explore that and do that. So I will forever be grateful to, to the leaders of this church and this church as a whole for that opportunity. And when Pastor Brad, he called me yesterday at about 3 o'clock. My wife and I had our, our three boys up in Champaign at the Elevate Trampoline Park, and I got my phone out to take the 100th picture of the day of our little kids bouncing and stuff, and I saw that I missed a call from, from Brad Brown, and I'm like, I wonder if he pocket dialed me or something. You know, we, he, Brad and I still talk every once in a while, but it's not super frequent, and so I text him back, and, you know, hey, we're busy right now. I'll give you a call back, and he's like, well, actually, I need to ask you a question. Is there any way that you could preach in Charleston tomorrow? And so I made some phone calls, uh, spoke with with my lead pastor and our elders and stuff, made sure everything was good. I got all my bases covered for uh, media stuff and camera work there at the church. And I, I called, texted Brad back. I was like, yep, I'll be there. We can do it. And so then I, I immediately started rolling in my mind, and I knew in my phone that I had a, basically an entire sermon typed out. I just had to take it from my phone to my computer so I could print it out and get it all done and organized. And then I remembered that about 10 days ago I got a new phone. And I, I was smart, too. I was, I was all over it. I took screenshots of all my notes and emailed them to myself, and I went and searched for that email, and I got screenshots of everything except for that message. So I was like, well, I guess it's back to square one. I thought this was going to be uh, so much easier, and now here it is, you know, 5, 6 o'clock in the evening. I guess we'll start writing a sermon right now. Sitting there watching the football games with my buddy and got my laptop out, and I was like, I apologize if I missed some of what you're telling me or missed part of the game, but I'm, I'm going to focus on this a little bit. And so then I also, uh, Brad had told me that he was going to post on the Facebook page of the church and let everybody know that I was going to be here today. That way people didn't walk in and wonder who in the world that weird looking guy up there is talking to us this morning. But So I went to the Facebook page to check that out, and then I found myself scrolling down a little bit, and I started to see some of the messages that had been preached previously. And it was kind of a surprise because as I was getting ready for this, I was like, okay, you know, Lord, what have I been reading in, this, what, in Scripture you know, the podcast that I listened to by some pastors, what, what have they been talking about? What audio books have I been listening to? Just kind of thinking, you know, the ways that the Lord speaks to me, you know, what are some of the key messages that he's been bringing out? And uh, Pastor Craig Rochelle does a leadership podcast that I absolutely love. And the last uh, title of the episode was Three Secrets to Creating Habits That Will Last. I was like, that's pretty good. That's, that's a, good, a good place to start. And, and I was thinking about some other things. And one of the books that he mentioned a lot was Atomic Habits by... Uh, uh, James Clear, I believe, is the, pa the, the author's name. And so I was like, oh, you know, okay, I kind of see a common theme here. And then as I was scrolling through the Facebook page of the church, I noticed that you guys were getting ready to start week three of a sermon series about habits. <laughs> like, okay, God, I, I see what you're doing here. I'm, I'm, I'm with you now. And so I started to pray about that and, and, really, and really dive into where God was leading me. And he started to show me some of the parallels from the, the highlights of the key points of the notes that I had in my phone that I remembered and how those went right hand in hand with habits and creating and sustaining good habits in our lives. And if there's anyone here this morning that has been questioning God's timing, if you've been praying for something that you've been waiting on an answer to and you're just not getting it yet, I am standing living proof this morning that his timing is perfect. The notes that I had started months and months ago, I, I sounded like a broken record every time I preached. I was like, well, I thought I was going to use this one, but God changed it on me again. Well, these are the notes for that message. God knows exactly what he's doing, but we'll get that back to that topic here in just a little bit. But so the, the more I thought about it and prayed about it and, and I started to dive into it and I didn't have time in the last like 12 hours to watch all four of Pastor Brandon and Pastor Brad's messages on habits. So if I repeat anything or if I reference a, a book or a scripture, uh, it's complete coincidence. Now, I believe that if I repeat anything or if I start to mention something else, I think that's the Holy Spirit that's trying to reinforce that in our hearts. But I want to start in Hebrews chapter 6 this morning, verses 16 through 20. We're going to read this together. We'll kind of break it up a little bit, dive into it a little bit deeper, and we'll get to the message that I believe God has for us this morning. But there in verse 16, it says, People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. 
God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Remember that verse. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And see, verse 16, there's a little bit of a preview for us. It kind of sets the stage for the following verses. It says, people swear by someone greater than themselves and the oath confirms what is said. See, people swear by someone greater than themselves. Everybody heard, I know everybody's heard somebody say, well, I swear on my mama. You know, I, I, I swear on my mama. Some people, unfortunately, use the Lord's name in vain when they swear. We won't get into that this morning. But they, the, the Bible says that we swear on someone that's greater than ourselves. So any mamas out there this morning just know that sometimes it may not be meant that way. But we swear on someone greater than ourselves. So take that as a compliment. But what we're doing when we do that, what we do when we say those words, is we're making an oath between ourselves and someone else. So let's see, verse 16 is setting us up for verse 17, where God takes his turn at making an oath. And it says that the unchanging nature of his purpose be very clear to the heirs of what is promised. See, that heirs, that's a key word in that scripture. Because Romans 8, 17 reminds us of this. It says, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. We are heirs of Christ. That verse confirms that it is speaking to us as believers today. It confirms that God is making an oath with you and I. And then we continue on in verse 18, and, and God begins to encourage us. Did you know that God encourages us today, church? And more, more importantly and more specifically, God wants to encourage you this morning. I hear so many times about different pastors or speakers of, oh, they're just a motivational speaker. Well, I get pretty motivated when I get into the Word. I don't know about you. I get encouraged when I get into the Word. God wants to encourage us today through the promises, through the oaths that He has made with you and I in His Word. What He has spoken to you, over you, and through you is true. The words that God has spoken to you, over you, and through you are true today. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he made an oath, if he made a promise 10,000 years ago, it's true today. If God promised you something when you were driving here this morning, if he promised you that you were going to get something out of the worship this morning, if he promised you that you were going to hear a word that was going to speak to your heart this morning, if he made that promise, it's true if God has promised you, like Abraham in the Bible, many children, if he has promised you blessings in the future, cling to that promise, cling to that oath, because it is true. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forever. Verse 19 leads us to the title of this message. The hope that the scripture brings, the hope that comes from knowing God's promises in your life, are and will always be true. That hope is an anchor for our soul. That hope is an anchor for our soul. God has made countless promises to you and I as believers in Scripture. Countless promises, countless oaths between himself and humankind. And he fulfilled every single one of those promises. Every single one of those oaths has been completed by the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. The blood that he shed on the cross was more than for just salvation. That's the start of it when we come, when we come to God as believers and we accept that salvation, we're saved, we have a seat in heaven, our name is written down in the heavenly book. But it's more than that. If you're here this morning and you've accepted salvation but you feel stuck, it doesn't stop there. If you're here this morning and you haven't accepted the gift of salvation, there's going to come a time for that at the end, I promise you that. But it doesn't just stop with salvation. The blood that Jesus shed on the cross was to protect us, to save us, to seal us, to heal us, to sanctify us. It was so much more than just salvation. And those promises, that blood, fulfilled the promises that God made to us in his word. Jesus is the anchor that our hope is secured to. 
I, I love, I actually looked it up and, and I didn't realize until last night that this is the only place that this exact word, that the, the original Greek word for anchor was used in the entire Bible. There's one place. And I found that interesting because Paul, the, the, the author that this book is attributed to, actually had quite a bit of experience with anchors in his life. I mean, after all, he was shipwrecked three different times. And Acts 27 tells us about one of those instances. And in verse 29, it says, Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. Paul made sure that, to state the importance of the anchors in the midst of the storm. When it looked like they were headed for certain tragedy, they let down the anchors. And God quickly reminded me as, as I was typing that verse into my notes that unfortunately we as people, we do that same thing very often. We're sailing through life and everything's going great and then we see trouble coming and then we, then we throw the anchors down and pray for daylight. <laughs> we pray that God would just swoop in and save us at the last minute cause, because we, we waited until the last second to rely on that anchor. See, we, we go through life just like these sailors went through that ocean. I, I'm sure that the vast majority, if not all of these men, had been on this particular part of, the, of water many times before, but at the very least they had been on water many times before and probably had encountered storms. See, we do the same thing in our life. We go through, we go through the motions. We rely on our, on our instincts. We rely on our experiences and we rely on our habits to get us through each day. So often, we do the same thing that those sailors had done and just set sail for where we are headed, where we want to go. We just go through the motions. We've done this a million times. We just walk through. My habits will get me through this. I've already got this figured out. I don't even have to think about it. I'm just going to do it. Just like these sailors had done. And it really got me thinking it, about habits are really an interesting thing. And one of the, one of the, the topics that, that Craig Rochelle had mentioned whenever he was teaching on this there was actually, he, he referenced a study done at, done at Duke University in 2006, and they actually found that out of all of the actions that you do in a day, out of every, everything that you do each and every day, over 40% of what we do is not a result of a conscious decision that we make, it's actually the result of a habit. Over 40%, almost half of everything we do on a day-to-day -day basis is a habit. It just comes naturally to us. What kind of habits do we have in our lives today, church? Are they good or are they bad? My buddy that was over with me last night, actually, he read something on Facebook, and it actually depicts one of my biggest habits perfectly. It said the danger about 10.30 p.m. is that it comes right before 2.30 a.m. if you're not careful. <laughs> my wife can attest to that. She's come out many nights. What are you doing? I'm ah, coming to bed. <laughs> And I wish I could stand here before you this morning and say that every single time I'm, I'm just entrenched in scripture or, and I'm in prayer or I'm worshiping the Lord. But sometimes when I let my habits lead the way, I'm watching one more episode of that series on Netflix or Hulu. Or I'm, I'm watching just 10 more minutes of, of scrolling through reels on Instagram and, and, and watching all these funny videos. Just 10 more minutes of, of being on Facebook or 10 more minutes of editing this perfect picture, or this video just right. And it's in those moments when I rely on my own habits, when I just coast through, every single time I pay for it the next day. Sometimes it's because I'm tired. Sometimes I didn't complete a task that I needed to complete that night, so I'm rushed in the morning and I'm trying to rush to work, and then I'm late to work. Our habits, almost half of what we do without even thinking about it has consequences. My question for us today the real question that I want us to look at and answer today is what habits are you anchored to? What habits, wh what anchors in your life are you tied to that are actually keeping you from Christ? What, what things are we anchored to that are actually getting in the way of what God has for us, what God has called us to? What anchors do we have in our lives today? Is our hope, is our hope anchored to the one that fulfills it in Christ? As we get back to the original scripture, we only went through about three and a half of the five verses. I want to I want to dive into those last that last verse and a half or so now in Hebrews six nineteen and twenty. 
where it, we, we had talked about where it says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters into the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And this is where our habits and our hope come together. This is where our habits and our hope, if we really dive into this scripture, if we really grasp onto the truth of God's word that he's, that he's teaching us here, our habits and our hope can actually become one and the same. Our anchor of hope enters into the sanctuary behind the curtain. See, in the early Bible days, the, the, the royal priest was the only one that could actually enter into God's presence. There was a curtain there, and he was the only one. He had to be anointed, and he was the only one. He had to go through so many different cleansing rituals. He had to do everything just right, and he was the only one that could truly be in the presence of God on the other side of that curtain. There's significance to everything in Scripture. He is the only one, the royal priest. Well, what, is the Bible, what does the Bible say about royal priests? Specifically, Jesus, our hope and our anchor. In Hebrews 2.17, it says this. For this reason, he had to be made like them, talking about Jesus, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. And then in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, it tells us this. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We've been reading a lot out of the book of Hebrews and a lot of scriptures about royal priests. Like I said, everything in scripture is significant. Everything in God's word can be used to teach, to correct, to lead us where God is calling us. The book of Hebrews was actually written to Hebrews. It was written to a group of Hebrew believers, but Paul, the reason he wrote this scripture and the reason he leaned so heavily into the royal priesthood is because this group of Hebrews that are now believers had been heavily influenced by their Jewish customs, by their Jewish patterns. And he knew that these people had a great focus on the royal priest. Paul wanted to make sure that these Hebrews understood that there was one royal priest now. Part of the scripture, the history and the context is important because we now we understand why Paul puts such heavy influence on it. But what does that mean for us? We, I don't know, maybe we are. We aren't a group of Hebrews. I don't know if anybody here has Hebrew descent. My father-in-law, I know, does. He'd be jumping up and down, waving his hand if we talked about that. But we are not a group of, of Jewish people that have that influence on us. So why, why is this important to us? Well, our, our main text this morning, our main passage where it speaks about Jesus going on our behalf, being our forerunner, going before us behind the curtain. Jesus is our royal priest. Jesus made way for us on our behalf. What Hebrews 6 is telling us is that God has anchored our hope in the very presence of God. That's why we can rely on it. That's why we can lean on it. That's why it's the anchor that will always hold, the anchor that will never give way, because it's anchored in the presence of God. And I get, I get passionate about that. I get excited when I talk about the presence of God because I've spent time there. And, and the time that I've spent in the presence of God because Christ has made it available to us is unlike anything else that you can experience in this world. And I know a lot of times I used to be the same way whenever a preacher would get up there and talk about getting into the presence of God and, and getting into the spirit and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, man, that just sounds so weird. This guy's a wacko. Just hurry up and get to the end so we can go eat lunch. Like that was, that was literally my mindset many years ago until I realized the significance of, of the presence of God and what it does in our lives and the significance of Christ being our anchor that holds us to his presence. See, Jesus went before us and he, he was our forerunner. He entered in before us, but he didn't stop there. 
Matthew 27, 50 and 51 tells us he took it one step further. This is speaking of the crucifixion. It says, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. Jesus didn't just enter the presence of God on our behalf. He died on that cross to tear that curtain open to give us access to the presence of God, to give us access to the very anchor of our hope in Christ. Just like we talked about earlier, his, his sacrifice on the cross was for so much more than salvation. Salvation, if you, if you don't get it, if you don't take that first step, you can't get to the rest of it. But don't stop at the sinner's prayer. Don't stop at one moment here at the altar or, or in, a, in, a, in a home of a, of a friend, a believer, wherever it was that you got saved. I've had people that come to Christ on my couch. I've led people to the Lord in an altar in church. It doesn't matter. But just don't stop there. There's so much more for us. See, when we align our habits with our hope, it becomes a habit to be hopeful in the presence of God. When we align our habits and our hope, hope becomes a habit. And when we align our hearts with our hope, we find that when we're anchored to that hope, the anchor of our soul, we won't be shaken when the storms come. We won't be moved. Because we're anchored in the holy place. We're anchored in God's presence. Don't discount God's presence. It's, it sounds strange. When I first really began understanding it, I didn't know how to communicate it. I'm still not the best communicator, but I'm going to try and try every single day. Don't discount what God's presence can do in your life. And there may be even some of you here thinking that, that like, that's great, man. Like, I get it. Like, you're really, like, you're really passionate about this. I've heard people talk about this before. Like, I try, I read my Bible, I pray, like I, I feel like I get into the presence of God, but man, life's still hard. I still got to deal with all this stuff. John was just up here sharing his heart about that exact thing. Even when we have that anchor, it's like, man, is it really, is it really worth it? Is it really going to do what it's supposed to do? You might even be thinking like, man, I used to go to a church that the, the pastor would talk about all the time, and then he got caught that he was having an affair on his wife, and the, the church crumbled. So many times, imperfect human beings get so much attention placed on them and set up on this pedestal that when we see them stumble, just like we stumble, oh, well, they're, they're a pastor, they're, they're an elder, they're a leader, they're this or that, or they're on TV, or they're, they're a pro athlete. If they can't do it, I can't do it. I'm not even going to try. They talk about being in the presence of God all the time. I don't know if there's anybody here that has known me for long, but I'm up here talking about being in the presence of God and how it can change you. And people will be like, dude, I know you. <laughs> I've known you for a long time. I know your past. I, I know what you used to say. I know you, how you used to act. To those people, my first response would be Psalm 34, 19, where it says that the righteous person may have many troubles but the Lord will deliver him from them all. Some translations say that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God will deliver him from them all. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. The righteous person may have many troubles. None of us are excluded. You could spend 24 hours a day in the presence of God, and outside of that, you're still an imperfect human. You still have the ability to make a mistake, just like me, just like anyone else in this room. Don't let your mistakes define you. Don't let what happened in the past prevent you from entering back into the presence of God or keep you from entering in the presence of God in the first place. My second response would be this. The boat's anchor doesn't keep the storm from happening. The boat's anchor allows the boat to withstand the storm. The boat's anchor doesn't hush the seas. It keeps the boat exactly where it's supposed to be, out of harm's way, if we're using the right anchor.
The third thing that I would say is that a boat's anchor is not in the same location as the boat. If you're on Lake Shelbyville or Lake Paradise, Lake Mattoon, Lake Sarah around here, I don't know what the deepest part of any of those lakes is, 20, 30, 50 feet maybe, I don't know. In the ocean, it could be hundreds of feet. The anchor does not stay in the boat to be effective. Their hope that we are anchored to is not in the same place that we are in. That's why when we get anchored to some th so many things of the world and we anchor to where we are, we anchor to what's around us, our spouse, our kids, our job, our, our families, our, our careers, our money, our house, our, our possessions. When we anchor to what's close, what's around us, it fails every single time. A boat's anchor is not in the same location. And ours is the same way. When we anchor to Christ, he's not here amongst us physically. We can't see and we can't touch him, and that frustrates me so many times. And I know that frustrates so many other believers. That, Man, I wish he could just sit down with me and have a conversation. I wish he could just explain this to me. I, I wish we could just have one hour. There's somebody, if you could have lunch with somebody for one hour, and so many people, oh, Jesus, I got a lot of questions. And we, we allow that physical barrier to prevent us from clinging to the anchor of hope that we have when really his presence that we are anchored to or should be anchored to is available 24-7. It's available here and now. Ryan invited the Holy Spirit in here to have his way and move amongst these people, to speak to our hearts in the presence of God. Stop putting your hope in worldly things and being surprised when it fails. That scripture in Acts chapter 27, Paul said that they let down four anchors. Spoiler alert, they still wrecked the boat. Four anchors. Most boats have one or two, one on the, on the bow in the front, one on the stern in the back. They let down four anchors like, man, this is going to be really bad, but we got four of them, we'll be good. We think, man, I, you know, my life's getting really bad, but I, I got a lot of money in the bank. I've got a reliable vehicle. I got a house that's almost paid. I, I'm, I'm good. I can, I, I can just cling to these things, and I'll weather the storm. But those things, those other things that we anchor ourselves to in our life are not designed to be anchored to. Only Christ, only Jesus in the presence of God is designed for us to be anchored to. Even when a boat isn't using the anchor, it's always close. There's no good captain out there that leaves port without an anchor. And on top of that, without an anchor that he trusts. So many times that that I, I can think of, I've, I've been out on a lake and, and I have, I've never been on a, an ocean or anything of great value, but there's so many times that I go out and I'm trying to fish or I'm trying to do something and I throw this little three pound anchor out of the boat and I'm like, why, why are we not over there? The fish were over there, I put my anchor out and I'm now I'm over here because it wasn't the right anchor. It couldn't withstand the test that I was putting it through because it wasn't designed for that. I'll close with, with this, last, this last thing here that the Lord really put on my heart and I asked permission to, to go into this so don't get weird and uncomfortable on me. But uh, many of us have been experiencing storms. I mean, what is it now, the last three, two, three years? It started out as like a six-week thing, and it was like, okay, this will be fine, and here we are like 172 weeks later or something like that, that it's still difficult. This last year has been hard for a lot of us, probably all of us. I can't speak for everyone. I can speak for my family, and I can speak that this last year has been very difficult. Uh, my good, good friend at work, Jason, if you, if you watch this online later, I love you, man. I appreciate you. You're a blessing in my life. He has gone through so much in the last year. I, I mean, 
a month or two ago, I, we, we were counting, and he had lost like 15 close family members and friends just in the last 12 months. And I think four or five days ago, add another one to it. So many of us are going through storms in this life and, and difficult times. And I can tell you this one thing. If you want to know what it looks like to be anchored to Jesus, not yet, I'm still talking. But after church, get on Facebook and go to my wife's Facebook page. This isn't a shameless plug for, for my wife or for, any, for us personally or anything. See, in 22 days will be the one-year anniversary of my wife losing her mom. Talk about a storm. 48 years old, very, very unexpected. Yet her boat didn't move an inch. There's hard times. I've woken up at 2 or 3 in the morning when she's in tears and just be there with her. So any of you that have lost a close loved one, a, a parent, a spouse, a, a child, a, a family member, a friend, it hits in random times. We know that. Sometimes we're you're out with your family having a good time and something just so small brings that memory up and that storm just comes rushing back. So how, how is she, I've always wondered this, seeing it from a distance, how, how does her boat not move? How, how, is, how has she not been rocked by this? And she'd probably tell you, like, yeah, he's full of it. Like, I've been rocked by this, but I can tell you that's just her being humble. I've seen her in so many times out in public, and, and the Lord will just bring someone to her, and she'll get started to talk with, the, with a young lady that who's having a hard time. She just, she's so good at picking up on that stuff, and she sees him from across the room, and she goes over to him, and, you know, are you okay? <sighs> And you get to the bottom of it and they just lost their mom or their dad or, or someone close to them. And she not only isn't rocked by that, but she can lead those people back to the same thing that she is anchored to. But how? How, how can she do that? Because her hope and her habits are one. She has a habit of getting into the presence of God and praying. And that's a challenge with, th with my three kids running around the house. She's made it a habit to get in the Word whenever she can, whether it's a verse here and there or a page here and there. Like, hey, I'm going to sneak off to my room. She's made it a habit. She's made it a habit to worship God no matter what. In that book I mentioned at the beginning, James Cleary says, we don't rise to the level of our goals, we fall to the level of our systems. Or in this case, you could replace systems with habits. We don't rise to the level of our goals, we fall to the level of our habits. And if her habits had been anything else over this last year, so many lives that she's been able to speak into and change through the power of the Holy Spirit would have still been struggling because her habits would have been something different. But because she's anchored to the Lord, and I use her in sermons all the time because she's a way better Christian than I am. <laughs> she's got that relationship with God. It's something that, that I admire. I'm a, I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to be the one that people are supposed to look to and admire, right? But she inspires me to be anchored to Christ, anchored in the presence of God every single day. Because you never know when someone else is going to need that anchor. You never know when someone else's boat is going to get blown by the storm and be coming right past yours, and you could have the anchor to tie them to to keep them safe. But is it a habit to lean on that anchor? Is it a habit in our life to put God first and trust in Him, seek His face, to put first the kingdom of God and seek his face, and all of this will be added unto you. Is that a habit in our lives? That 
podcast title, Three Secrets to Starting Habits That Will Last. It's very simple. Make it small, make it obvious, make it automatic. Make it small, make it obvious, make it automatic. So many times we think, okay, I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to anchor to Christ. I'm going to get into the presence of God, but I don't have four hours to pray. Make it small. I don't care if you start anchoring yourself to Christ by reading one verse a day. I've got the, the YouVersion Bible app on my phone. It sends me a prayer reminder every morning when I get to work because Lord knows I need to pray when I get to work sometimes. And it sends me the verse of the day. Even if that's just where you start, start small, start obvious, start automatic. Put post-it notes on your mirror or in your car. Set automatic reminders on your phone that it just pops up. Boom, it's automatic. Put those notes up. It's obvious. I wake up and the first thing that I see is is the reminder of who I am in Christ, that I'm a co-heir with Christ, that I'm a royal priest, that I am seated in the heavenlies next to God with Christ. Put that up somewhere that you see it. Make it obvious. Make spending time in his presence automatic. And I promise, it's not going to happen overnight. And that's okay. So many times we see the people in our lives, our our grandma and grandpa, or a mom and dad, or or a brother, or a a pastor, or a a leader in a church, or a, a leader in a church online. We see these people and everything just looks perfect. We see their highlight reel on social media and we we bind ourselves to the same standards that we think their life is tied to and then when we fail or we get into the habit and then get out of the habit, it's like, oh, forget it. Why even try? I fail every single time. I promise you, those people do too. And I promise you that wherever they're at now, they didn't just wake up there. They started with small, obvious, automatic habits in their life that leads them to the presence of God, to the anchor of hope for their soul. If you want to ask God to help you start this process this morning, these altars are open. I didn't ask permission, but I know how this church rolls. I know these altars (laughs) are open. If you need to come up this morning and give your life to Christ for the first time and pray that prayer that's the, that, that's, that's the starting point, if you need to get to the starting line of this race this morning, I know that there are plenty of people in this church that will come up and pray with you so you can accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you've been starting this and maybe you listen to the same podcast I do and for the last week you've been like taking your vitamins every morning and you're getting really good at that, but there's still that one area that you really want to start a habit in, a small, obvious, automatic habit to get you into the presence of God every day. You don't even have to have someone pray with you. Come up here, open your arms, look to heaven, open your heart to God. Make today the day that you decide to tie to the anchor of hope and let your hope and your habits come together to make your life new. That's what the gospel's all about, right? That's what Jesus was all about when he was here, right? He didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live. He came to make sick people well. He came to take us into the presence of God where nothing else matters and nothing else can take you away from that. It means a lot. That Pastor Brad gave me that call yesterday to come back and hug on John and all the people that I've missed and see so many new faces in this building. There's no way, and this is no credit to me, this is not bragging or a humble brag or anything like that, so don't take it that way. There is no way that I could get a call at 3 in the afternoon and be here at 10 o'clock in the morning ready to go if my anchor was not in Christ. I can't write this. I can't, I have never in my life, I don't know how many, it's not a lot, I don't know how many sermons I've wrote, how many notes I've put together or Bible studies I've led, I've never typed 15 pages in a few hours ever. But because I'm anchored in the presence of God, I know right where to go when I need Him the most. I know right where to go that He can use me as a vessel. All I do is make myself available to Him. That's all Pastor Brandon, Pastor Brad, everybody does. All of the elders, their heart is, God, here I am. Use me for what you need me to do. Speak through me what words you would have me speak.
because they're anchored in the presence of God. Why do we, why do we always have hope? I'm an eternal optimist. Like, like there's very few things that can get me to look at something negatively. And it's not because I was born that way or that's just how I am or that was how I raised. It's because my anchor is in the presence of God where hope survives. If you've lost hope this morning, come up to this altar and make yourself available to God and get your hope back in his presence. This is possibly the most hopeless two or three year stretch that many of us have seen in the last at least hundred years. If you need that hope back, get it back this morning in his presence. I can promise you, if, if you've never experienced it before, I'm here to tell you this morning that his presence is everywhere in this room right now. I can feel him in this room right now because there are people in this room, myself included. Listen, this isn't me preaching down to anybody. This isn't me saying, hey, come be like me. This is me included. His presence that I need so badly in my life is here today. If you've never experienced his presence, don't leave today without experiencing it. If you can't feel it from your seat, come up here. If you can't feel it from where you're at, don't go back into your same hopeless vehicle to go back to the same hopeless home in the hopeless situation and go to your hopeless job tomorrow. It feels that way sometimes, doesn't it? It's felt like that for me three months ago, probably. But I go back to my anchor in the hope of God's presence, the hope of Jesus Christ himself. That's the key. That's why she's still got a smile on her face every single day. That's why my kids wake up in a spotless house and go to bed in a spotless house. I brag about that all the time. Because we can be anchored in the hope of the presence of God. Father, I thank you so much for this church, Lord. The opportunity to be back here today, God, to share your word, Lord, I thank you for your word. Not just the words that you've given me, Lord, but for your word, your spoken word that we call scripture. Father, draw us to your word. Draw us to you in prayer, Lord. Bring us back to your presence where we can find hope in this world. Lord, I, I pray that you stir in hearts like you've never done before, that you wouldn't let one single person leave this room without being tied to the anchor of Christ. Have your way in this place. Even as we close in song, as we make our way back to our vehicles, as we make our way back to home and lunch or wherever we're going. Have your way in all of us today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.